Uh, he and I are the ones that work on this program. It really uh, is a labor of love, I think, between the, the two of us to bring this thing to life. It's a year and a half from the time where the artists are selected to the time when the videos actually premiere. So um, Kyle was not able to travel to LA. He is currently back in New York working the live stream. Um, but big thank you to Kyle as well. Uh, before we screen the videos, we want to note that the program does contain depictions of injection drug use, and before that video plays, there will be a note on screen. Uh, the video program is just under an hour, and then it will be followed by the conversation with Davina and I, and of course Clifford isn't able to be here, but his friend uh, Tasneem Bufalfel, who edited the film, will um, speak briefly um, uh, and have some words to share on his behalf. Uh, and so that, or with that, um, here's being and belonging.
tenemos que educar para el amor a los chicos. Tiene que entender que el profiláctico no la protege de nada. Porque el profiláctico, el virus del SIDA, escúcheme, el virus del SIDA, doctora, dígame si no es cierto, atraviesa la, porf la porcelana. El Por virus favor. del SIDA atraviesa la porcelana. Por favor. Por favor, por favor. Sí, sí pude sostenerle la mano antes del apagón. Soy hija de este sistema perverso, de este sistema desigual. Pero también soy resiliente porque vivir es un arte, y el arte un privilegio. Soy esclava de mis palabras, esas que me ataron antes de nacer. Alabado sea el ritonavir jarabe y todos esos dioses a los que le rezaste, ninguno pudo salvarme, porque no necesité ser salvada. Claro, yo, soy, yo soy vertical, significa que lo tenés cuatro desde que naciste. Y yo me enteré a los 11 porque, como de los 7 hermanos, soy la única que tomaba pastillas. Sí. Como que yo decía, ¿por qué? Me dieron por muerta antes de haber nacido. Y para desgracia del mundo, o no, estoy más viva que nunca. La venganza es estar viva, desearme sana, protagonista de una historia que no nos incluye pero que a partir de hoy nos invita a pasar por la puerta. Bueno, pasemos. Es el hecho de que esta ley incluye por primera vez a las personas que nacieron con VIH. Somos un montón pero cada vez estamos siendo menos por falta de políticas públicas. Más de la mitad de mis compañeros están muertos, otro tanto intentando la felicidad. No, no, no tengo estadísticas claras, pero ¿sabes que tengo? Muchas ganas de quemar todo. Pero porque antes no había medicación y cuando llegó la medicación era para adultos, porque no había medicación para niños. Así que imagínate un nene, yo empecé tipo, a los 3, 4 años a tomar medicación, vos más o menos sí, 4 años. años. Morí tantas veces que la misma muerte está cansada de mí. ¿Cómo hacemos esta vida más vivible? Quiero que fabriquen medicación pediátrica, que a nadie le falte la atención focalizada. No quiero más políticas de rescate. Fracasamos y fracasaron con la prevención. Quiero imaginarme la vida sin VIH, deshabitar la piel medicada, quiero entrar en una piel más justa, quiero que saquen la cura. Quiero que nuestros encuentros no sean más para despedir a alguien. My story traces back 26 years ago, 1995. 1997. It's been 21 years. 27 years. 20 years. 22 years. 
I was 27 years old. Felt alone. Unwanted. Afraid. It was very scary. No one would love me anymore. Didn't think I would have someone to talk to. I was angry. I was stunned. I didn't know anyone it with the diagnosis betrayal. could relate. And how this happened to me being a black woman and it was considered a gay man's disease. I was embarrassed. And it was devastating. It was devastating. It was devastating. How long did I have to live? I thought I was going to die. The lady told me I had seven years to live. I found out that I was pregnant. I had a three-year-old son at the time. I was a 27-year-old mother of a young daughter. Kept it a secret for two years before I ever even told anybody. When I was about to deliver, the anesthesiologist screamed down the hall, you got to be careful. They brought my youngest in, and in that bassinet, they had a red index card that said, wear gloves. Medical mistrust, man, it is so real. And I was told that I would never have babies again, that I should get everything just cut out. I wanted to have another child. So in 2014, my baby was showing signs of fetal anemia. He was born, but he was barely breathing. When the doctor calls me, he says, I've never dealt with people like you. The stigma has been so tremendous. As a black woman, that's the reason why my baby boy's life was taken. And that was one of the worst days of my life. I started just planning my death. Because I was from a very small town. The whole town was saying how I was contagious. My mom, she went to the church and she told her friend. And her friend started telling everybody. People were cleaning the bathroom after I used it. I was made homeless. That sent me into total isolation. Carrying that secret kept me in a bad mental space. I didn't want anybody to know me. I didn't think I wanted to exist anymore. Because of the self-stigma and the outside stigma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am now 52. I would have never, never imagined, imagined that, that I would, I would be, be living, living with HIV. HIV. The only thing that I heard of about HIV was Easy e and Magic Johnson. I never saw anyone who looked like me, especially a woman. It still impacts today. When somebody asks you how you got it, that's stigma. Being a young black woman, I felt very left out. Not many billboards, commercials. I didn't see a lot of young people. Finding places to fit in. Being a black woman was hard. There were no black women stepping up. No one wanted to be associated or even hear about me. People were really just afraid. It was so deep-rooted. It took me 17 years to realize the internal stigma I carried wasn't just mine. What about other black women who live with HIV? I'm fighting every day until I can erase the stigma that has caused so much tremendous harm. We have to work so that we feel empowered. I am a survivor. I am a survivor. It made me feel like, whoo, Tam, you have some barriers to break. You deserve to take up space and have your voice heard because I didn't see little to none of the black woman at all. I did eventually find places that were supporting black women. My buttons show all of the places that show me love and support. My life has changed forever because you equals you. Undetectable equals untransmittable. It caused me to focus on something positive. I began to say, you know what, I can talk about this. I'm taking my power, and instead of people stigmatizing me, I want to change the narrative. My spirituality 
loving myself and being there for my children allowed me to persist. Once we get educated about the experiences of the black women living with HIV, we can start to dismantle stigma. Can't wait for anyone to do it for us. I don't live with HIV on some levels. HIV lives with me, and I'm going to give it a hell of a ride. I am thriving, living my life unapologetically, and if resilience had a picture to go with the definition, it would absolutely be me. Red reminds me, red reminds me, red reminds me to be free.我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们的眼睛是如何的呢？我们
꿈틀대는 검은 빛은 안전과 위험으로 우리를 갈라놓으려 했을지도 모른다. 몸속에 수천 개의 작은 덩어리를 쌓아가며 발견한 것은 나눌 수 없음이 우리로 증명될 수 있다는 것과 매 순간들이 흐른 뒤에도 당신은 이것을 쌓아갈 필요가 없다는 것이다. 이 작은 덩어리들은 검은 빛에 흔들리는 당신과 나를 지키기 위해 쌓고 있다. 서로를 향한 눈길이 날카롭지 않도록 서로를 오가는 얇은 마귀에 유난스럽지 않도록 그렇게 차근차근 걸어가고 있다. 이제는 그렇다와 아니다로 이리저리 헤매지 않아도 괜찮았고 안전과 위험의 경계 또한 흐려지고 있었다. 이러한 상황들이 생각만큼 대단한 무언가가 아니길 바라고 당신과 나 사이의 틈도 특별하게 여겨지질 않길 바라며 그 어떤 차이에도 뒤엉킨 의미가 필요하지 않길 바란다. 검은 빛이 사라진 어둠에서 결국 우린 무엇을 찾았을까? 어둠 속에서 아무것도 없다고 보이지 않는 것은 아니었으며 흐린 시야 속에서 친밀한 호흡을 유지하며 숨을 불어주고 또 다른 순간들을 찾아 비출 테니까 It's dangerous. We we better glamorize it, but like it's dangerous to tell people the truth. They don't want to hear the truth, and it's dangerous to expose who you are because people may cringe at you, and and that's nobody wants that, right? Like it's the image that we have of someone that does drugs as a kid, right? Is that they're gonna die, right? And that sticks with a lot of people for a long time. And, and when you are curious about drugs, when you, when, let's just say you, drugs have always been in your life, in the periphery because you're poor, or because you're rural, or because you're whatever, right? It's like they've always been around there. So you didn't really get a choice whether or not you knew about drugs. You didn't get that safety from people. And then you're being punished for it because you are just are living your life. Like, that's fucked. That's fucked. Thank you. 
See, um, I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna get at what you mean by esoteric. Are, are, do, you, do you mean it in, 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 the, in, the, in the sense of the actual sense of it, or are we looking at the marginal, or, or pink, or because for me, esoteric uh, it involves a, 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 a level of a, of a spiritual, or a metaphysical, or a, a communal um, focus on a practice that 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 makes it. Um, that, 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 that formalizes it in some way, um, and I think that I think that the way that I, the way that I explain to people is the more risk, like we focus on risk a lot, and that, that, that's that's too bad because because the reason the reason that it's framed as risky is be, it's not necessarily because it's dangerous, it can be, but because it, it deserves respect. The more, the more, the more risk means the most. It doesn't mean don't do it. It means do it with a, a sense of knowing and understanding because you have to. It's a skill set. Like it, it's just more. It's, it's more things to know. So it just makes sense to and frankly, with anything that's addictive. And I had to learn this. You want to not be addicted. To, to, you want to avoid addiction because you're told to avoid addiction. But what they don't tell you is that is that. Um, addiction happens whether you're looking at it or not. And it happens differently to all people, and you know, people, people have to go to self-determine. But my thing is, then why not teach people how to be good at it from the moment they start? And explain that to them. Want to think about all the other people we know that have killed themselves and all the other people that have made decisions that other people didn't appreciate and told them that they were fucked up or told them that they were wrong or told them that they were immoral or told them that they were stupid or told them that they didn't know what they were doing or told them another opinion that they didn't want to hear and think about all those people including ourselves and those decisions that we've made and think about decisions that we'll have in our future and think about all the space that's above us right now to make decisions. So I got some juice, the people want juice.
nobody, 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 nobody can help me. Nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows. Body knows, no body knows, no body knows, no body knows, body knows, no 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 body knows. Hay otra manera de penetrar a la historia universal, que es la creación, la invención de una doctrina. Cortés es el creador del imperialismo en, en todo el periodo histórico en que el imperialismo estuvo en ejercicio. Hay que recordar siempre que el imperio británico, en sus conquistas, no hizo sino seguir la doctrina de Hernán Cortés, una doctrina humanitaria, que evitaba conflictos, lo suavizaba. Este sistema que inició Cortés y que después han seguido todos los conquistadores, todos los colonizadores, de ocupar una población, ocupar una nación, y no acabar con todos, sino que escogía dentro de aquel régimen y caduco y vencido, sin embargo escogía los mejores elementos para dejarlos con autoridad a fin de que sirvieran de intermediarios entre la nueva situación y la antigua.
piel dorada. Reluce mientras la luz del sol te acaricia. Aliméntate del sol, del calor. Del fuego que se vierte desde el cielo sobre ti. Brilla por tu propia cuenta y aduéñate del mundo. Morena, Prieta, India, Teca y Mareña, como tus ancestras, tu abuela, tu madre y tu tía. Deja que el sol dibuje tu sombra, tu silueta divina, de cabello negro y aroma de sal. Hermosa cobertura que te envuelve, que cubre todo tu cuerpo, tu bello y sidoso cuerpo de sangre caliente y piel morena. Deseo nombrar, en el idioma de mi madre, lo que ha hecho de esta carne, su nido, lo que ha hecho de esta sangre, bebida, nombrarle... Vinina Yagasá. Compañera, ¿cómo nombrar, cuando son ahora míos la lengua y el rostro del colono, una aberración cromática producto de siglos de dominación, cuando mía es la complicidad del mestizaje? Nakishili. Blanco eres, máscara que al portarse nos hace cómplices del exterminio. Rudí de ya. Doy la espalda a lo que creo. ¿Por dónde comenzar? Rudí de Shekendaviani. Tal vez por el corte. ¿Qué pasaría si suspendiéramos la fila? Si hiciéramos de esta larga espera médica una rebelión. Tal vez el reencuentro vendrá de la sangre y de lo que le habita. De la sangre y no del mestizaje. Para entonces poder decir, así sirvió allí. Para reunir lo disperso, acercar lo divergente para establecer aquello quebrado en una suma generosa. Mientras tanto, Guyano, bailemos. Bailemos porque aún no han cumplido su palabra, porque puede que hoy haya desabasto, porque puede que mañana nos prendan fuego. Y así, lo que la danza dispersó una vez, que la danza ahora lo una. Guyano, pues. I had fear, fear you won't be here. 
I had you no know, fear of dying. That took a great toll. I mean, a great toll. Do I have a life, or am I just living? And with all the itness of him, that rare stupefying mouth and its secretion, where once you imagined swallowing it and letting it fall down your chin, do I have a life, or am I? And by jail propriety and by God, you found each other's darkness, where fractions you most wanted seen, in the glare of windows and elderly men and sad wives, does life have living, or am I? And for his sick wit, the one that spat you out when a new flavor arrived, anointing the curse of not yet upon your crown, just life. And these types of questions, so on and forth, among the other mistreated beliefs underneath, and on and forth, beliefs of these kinds sprung up in the ground of his memory, and on and these kinds of thoughts. Am I just or am I living? My name is Michael Baron Withrow. If I was honestly, let me put it like this. If I was a young boy or whatever, I'd be out to date my ass off. <laughs> and wouldn't have no quorums. I wouldn't be scared. I did run across somebody that don't have it, I would tell them I have HIV. But by me reading a lot on the HIV areas, and there are articles in there that tell you you could date a straight person and you cannot transmit it. But that would be up for them to believe that or not. But as long as I believe it, it's fine. <laughs> There's others. That's all it is to it. There's others. There's other people that will accept you. My name is D'Angelo Lavelle Williams. At this point, I am public about my HIV diagnosis. It's on, you know, if I'm on a dating app or sex app, it's on there. So it's like public knowledge is what I'm thinking. Unless I feel like you don't know and you're talking or corresponding with me in a way that I feel like you don't know, I might inform, but at this point I'm just like, no one's asked. My mother has grown a lot. I know how she felt about people with HIV then. I feel like it would be this sort of a bomb-like effect if I just like told her, told her. I mean, she asked why I didn't tell her, and I was just like, well, I didn't feel like I was, you know, in a rush to just like have that conversation with you. I didn't feel like it was much of a conversation that needed to be had. I've never really had like any kind of deep conversation with my family. You know, people don't tell me that, you know, they have cancer or whatever. It's just like, I don't think HIV should be any different. I say you tell people what you want when you want. It's your narrative. <laughs> Take control. And each time you talk to an individual, they give you some type of incentive of hope. And with that hope, you grab onto it. You saying, oh, they did it, I can do it. <laughs> there must have been an 
Froze's blood high red regardless. Wishes for a lover need be heaven sent. My curiosity killed me. The urge I knew came and went. I didn't want none of it anyway, the truth is. It's my fault I went without protection. I accept this treatment sadly. Often amounts to rejection, the truth of it all. Myself, even though I didn't fully, I desired someone to understand. For about a year, I held my status hostage. When he told me it was okay, I let go of some fears. I know that you're present now. My only wish is that we make it through some years. everyone what y'all think of the films um, I wanted to start by giving uh, Tasmin Bufafel who is here with us she did a lot of the editing on Clifford's film and since Clifford can't be with us I wanted to give her a moment to share some reflections on working with Clifford and um, some of his um, his, his vision, his priority for, for the film that she was editing with him. So if you want to come up. Hi, everybody. So my name is Tasneem, and yeah, I worked with Clifford to edit this film and shot some of it too. And I feel like the process was very much a reflection of Clifford's approach to his artistic practice and that it's deeply rooted in honesty and intimacy and intention. And I feel like everything that we felt watching the film and all of that vulnerability and tenderness was very much present in the process of making it too and in all the rooms that we shared together. So 
yeah, I think there's just like a commitment to those virtues that show up in the film and show up in the process. So yeah, I'm very grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I think what you just described, you see that in so much in the rest of Clifford's practice and the level of intimacy and, and care in his photography. Yeah. So great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could be, glad you could be here and to, to share that. Yeah. If it is here in spirit. <laughs> um, and, and now I would like to invite down Davina D. Connor. going to read a short bio for her here. Um, Davina is a HIV educator, podcast host, and international speaker who has been living with HIV since 1997. Her podcast, Positively D Discussions, won ADAP's 2017 Leadership Award for working to dispel internalized stigma and change how society views HIV. Davina received the Persistent Advocacy Award from AIDS Watch in 2019 and has been featured in numerous magazines for her ongoing advocacy, including ANU, Positively Aware, Denver's 5280, Paz Magazine, HIV Plus, and Health Stories Projects. She works against HIV criminalization as a member of the Positive Justice Project, is a board member of Las Vegas, Ryan White and Nevada's HIV Prevention Planning Group, She's also the Creative Eng Engagement Outreach Specialist for Prevention Against or Pre Prevention Access Campaign. So everybody, welcome Davina. Thank you. Glad you could be with us from Vegas today for the for the conversation. Uh, I wanted to start by just giving you a moment to um, just catch up with you and hear about how you're feeling with uh, the videos premiering all over the world and the excitement of it all and, and how it's felt for you. It's exciting, it's really exciting. Um, first I wanna say thank you to Visual Aids and to you and uh, Kyle for all the work that you did, putting all of this together. It was, it was shocking, <laughs> you know, all the hard work that you guys put into getting these short documentaries out. So I just wanna tell you thank you. Um, I wanted to start with a question um, just um, for you to tell us a little bit about the process of the video. Of course, you worked with Karen Hayes as well, who's with us. Um, and um, I, I wanted to know a little bit more about the process of interviewing people for the film and, and uh, getting them to feel comfortable, to um, be vulnerable. So in the beginning, um, when I reached out to Karen about the Visual AIDS Project, it, at first it was going to be just the maybe hands, you know, women's hands, their feet, their earring, um, not really showing their faces, but only their voices with the visual. But once I actually flew to the different women's states to film them, all these women I already knew, and, and they were open with their, with their status. So once Karen started taking the pieces that I had and putting them together, we realized, hey, we can, we can use this the way that it is. Mm -hmm. But then the layering of the voices, when Karen started layering in the voices, it made me realize that this is how it should be. Both of us agreed when the voices were being layered because it, it, it gave you a sense of what the women were really feeling inside, how they were being layered. And so um, from the layering and then uh, the transitioning and all the women agreed that, you know, they, they wanted their faces there. So that's how we about doing it. I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, same as with Clifford's, I think uh, the um, conversation that we were just having, I think that the care in there is, um, that went into the practice is evident and um, just by the women's uh, a, a agreement to be vulnerable and, and to share themselves in the way that they did. Um, 
when I think about your film and, and Clifford's as well, transformation is a word that comes to my mind um, because we see um, across both of your films a, a, a type of trans transformation where um, in, in your film, you know, it's almost like divided evenly where the first half is uh, the women t discussing all of these um, barriers uh, all the stigma that they faced, um, all of the hardships, and then the second half is uh, kind of turning the corner and s seeing new um, opportunities and, and, and a new way of, of, of living. Um, and there's one line from Deidre in it that says, I don't live with HIV. On some levels, HIV lives with me, and I'm going to give it a hell of a ride. Um, so I'm curious, can you talk about transformation in your films and maybe also how it relates to your own journey um, and finally being able to speak about HIV? Yeah, um, so I can talk about the transitioning in my life when it comes to HIV and how the, the short, how the film was put together. It was, for, for me, it was the stigma that so many black women face when they first find out that they're living with HIV. And then the fear of not wanting anyone to know that they're living with HIV. But then it transitions into this life that they're thriving and they're living and they're happy and that actually no one can stop them now. Mm -hmm. So now they're open with their HIV status. And that was the same way it was for me that whole transition, um, living with HIV for 25 years, and 18 years of the 25 years, I didn't know one person who lived with HIV. And so I became an advocate seven years ago. And it took this big weight off of my shoulders, and now I could breathe. Mm -hmm. And so making this, this film, we wanted it so other women, other black women could see that they can thrive and they can live and that they can be happy, you know, living with HIV, just to take the weight off of their shoulders and know that there are other black women out there, you know, that's going, that were, went through the same thing that yeah. they went through. Yeah, I mean, that leads me to like my follow-up question, which is what do you think the role of community is in transformation? The role of community, I talk about community a lot because community for me is everyone coming together as one, not as separate entities, but if we come together as one, um, we can make great change when we come together as one. Um, so belongingness is the theme of this year's program. Um, and it centers on stories that are left out of mainstream HIV AIDS narratives. And both you and Clifford's videos, they center black folks of various genders living with HIV. Uh, we know that here in the US, black people are disproportionately impacted by HIV, but um, despite that, there's very much still a whitewashing of HIV AIDS narratives, especially when it comes to art. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, like, what would you like black people to know, specifically black women, um, who don't see their experiences represented? Or what would you like to say? Yeah. You have to show up. If we don't show up, if we don't speak up, if we don't use our voices, then how can we even share our experiences to help other black women in the community? So we must show up. We have to show up. Um, I'm curious um, about the role of music in your video. Um, this year's program was really exciting, um, I think for me and Kyle, because it, it did stand apart from previous years. And one of the things that sets it apart, I think, is that it's a very kind of sensory experience, and I think that's true across all the videos, that the soundtracks of all of them, um, the kind of um, auditory, like the uh, kind of like bodily noises, like gasping and, and all of those kind of things that you hear throughout make it a much more sensory experience overall, um, as opposed to like some previous years where there were more um, like historical types of documentaries mixed in. Uh, this, this year is, um, 
I mean, a, a part of it is all of the artists living with HIV and it coming from those perspectives, it has a much more personal and poetic feeling. And I think the music was a big part of that. You, I remember we were speaking earlier this year about um, you meeting Akira and yeah, do you want to so, tell us a little yes. bit about like meeting Akira and um, so yeah. we were me and Karen Hayes were trying to find music and she says Davina I found this woman you really need to listen to her her name was Akira Ray and when I listened to it we both agreed that this was it her voice it, would, it just did something to us it also brought tears to our eyes when we would listen to her sing so um, Karen sent her the sent her the film, and Akira put her vocals to the film as she watched it, and that's how it ended up the way that it did, using her vocals and then the transitioning through the film where it went from that, uh, you know, that, that quiet tone, and then towards the end, it where the women were thriving, the tone of her, her voice changed through the, through the film, but her voice is amazing. Yeah. Um, great. Um, do you do you have any other final reflections on the the process of making the film, um, or or seeing it in, in the context of the other films? And well, all the films are great. <laughs> Every single one of them are great. Everybody is a great artist in their own right. Um, everybody has their own way in how they convey how HIV has. Uh, hurt them or gave them any kind of pain or the stigma. So all the films were great. Um, again, I just want to tell you thank you um, for allowing me and Karen um, Hayes to be able to be a part of this. Absolutely. Um, we can open it up to the audience if you have any questions for Davina. Um, now we would, we would love to hear. Right here in the front. Um, they're going to bring a mic down to you. You talked a little bit about how it shifted, the focus shifted during the course of putting it together. How long, how long did that take when you got that realization? How much work had you already put into it at that point? I don't think we didn't put in that much work. Um, Karen, Karen put the, we, we started putting like hands and earrings together, but I'm going to be honest, I didn't film them very well. <laughs> <laughs> so the videos of the women, once, once she started putting those together, we knew right then that that's the way that it should had, had turned out because the women were open with their HIV. So it, it, it was simple after that. Really, it was really powerful. And Thank you. Built. The ending with the empowerment is really uplifting, and I really appreciated that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it brings tears to my eyes every time I watch it. Every single time I watch it, it does it to me. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the website that you've developed too, that and like the continuation of the project? So through the through us creating the 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 film, I decided to put together a a website so that people can reach out to Karen and I, um, any of the women, if they wanted them to come and speak in their state or choose them to go somewhere to speak and talk about the film so we can continue to keep sharing the film. But not only that, for other women to reach out to us so that we can do other films with other women mm -hmm. because we want to continue to keep this going. Uh, referencing what you were saying about community, how do you feel like we can have intergenerational conversations um, about AIDS as, um, you know, time goes on and younger generations have drastically different relationships? relationships? For me, it's always a tough one, um, especially with the younger generation. I, I always say, how can I put this in, in, in words? So. I can tell you what I do to reach, to reach people. I, I have events. 
That's what I do. And, and I don't call them HIV events, especially in the black community. If you put the words HIV or AIDS, no one's going to show up. So you call it a health event. But within the health event, you invite people and speakers that can speak about HIV. You invite speakers that can talk about their journey, but you also incorporate PrEP, which is a, a medication that stops people from, the, who are not living with HIV, who are negative, um, from transmitting, from, from HIV being transmitted to them. You can bring that in there. You can talk about sexual health. There's so many different topics when it comes to taking care of our sexual health, but you can bring all of those, those into the event, but then also have testing. Um, and, and that's what I do to bring people in. That, that's the only way you can do it, because they're not, no one's gonna show up when they see those three letters at all. It, it scares everybody, there's a, there's a big fear still. I see a question in the back there. Thank you, Divina. The film is so amazing. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to maybe just point out and ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, one of the most um, powerful parts of the video is just listening to the resonance of what stigma is like and that kind of isolation. And it seems like that's something that, um, you know, you knowing the, the, the subjects and the, the, the friends in the video, um, and the women in the video, um, it's the thing that you're bringing forward. So how do, I don't know, how do we, how can we really learn and be with what is, you know, obviously being carried? Like, how do you think about that for, for the viewers? Like, how can we be closer to that feeling? How can you be closer to the feeling of, well, I, I guess what I mean is like, you're bringing, that's so brought to the surface, and it's the thing that really resonates, and I'm just trying to figure out like ways that we can continue to be in conversation so that that is not continued, that stigma isn't, that kind of stigma isn't continued. I just want to try to figure out language for that. Right. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. Stigma is not going anywhere. It's just not. We all know that. We can continue to keep educating everyone, but stigma's not going anywhere. I, I say continue to normalize HIV, um, speak about it more, and maybe change the language when you talk about HIV, especially when you're around someone who's living with HIV. The language is very important. Um, I've, I've talked to Karen many times about language and, and not saying someone is infected or if someone is diseased. You just say they're simply a person who is living with HIV. And just watch how you speak about HIV because the person next to you could be living with it and you don't even know it. That reminds me of a part in the film. I think it's Tamara. She says, when somebody asks you how you got it, that stigma as well. So, yeah, I think it's just a continual... Part of it is being in community with people living with HIV um, and learning from them as well. I want to say your film was so incredible, just really, really Thank powerful you. and really moved me. Thank you for bringing this work to us. Um, I was really impressed by just how um, just how great the audio was that you got from your interviews, and I'd love to hear more about your interview process and any advice you might have for other filmmakers and documentarians who are doing interview-based work. So because Karen Hayes is a documentary filmmaker, um, she gave me a lot of advice. Um, I used, with some of the women, I used a, um, a lapel mic with my cell phone, and I recorded them with a, GroPo, a, a GoPro, and that's how we did the recordings. But as far as how it sounds here, Karen would have to talk to you about the process and how she put that together with the sound mix. So we did a sound mix and, and had the voices coming out of, she worked it to where they had the voices coming out of different parts of the, uh, of the film instead of just coming right out. A voice was over here and a voice was over there. So they put it together that way. 
um, is, and you knew most of the women you said beforehand, I knew all, right? I knew all of them. So the, there was a natural level of, yes. of comfort. So yeah, that was a part of it as well. Yeah, 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 I knew all of them. Um, any other final questions? Okay, well, thank you, Davina, and thank you everyone thank you. for coming today. Um, the videos are online and free to view, so if you want to return to them at any point, just it's at video.visualaids.org. You can, you can see all of the, tonight or um, all of this afternoon's videos, and you can see all the past videos that we've uh, commissioned as well. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>